Hi guys, this is Natalie Roars, the voice of Hannah for Fear Effect Sedna, and you are listening to Residents of Evil. Fear Effect was released in the year 2000 and had a positive reception from reviewers and gamers alike. The game focused on a cast of far from heroic mercenaries who got caught up in a battle with demons to save the world. Fear Effect was praised for its intriguing story and well acted characters and within a year it spawned a prequel, Retro Helix. Retro Helix showed how the core characters from the game became a team and introduced Rain, the love interest for the game's heroine Hannah. While both games established a loyal fan base, the third game in the series, Inferno, was cancelled, even though it was close to completion. And that was the end of Fear Effect, until now. Sushi, a small indie development company, gained approval from Square Enix to produce a new game in the series, reuniting the characters on a new mission. Enter Fear Effect Sedna. Being fans of the series, we have had the amazing opportunity to get in on the ground floor of the rebirth of Fear Effect. We have been fortunate enough to interview each incredible actor claiming the roles for the returning and new characters, as well as a small indie studio, Sushi that has the passion to bring Fear Effect back to life. Our series of interviews starts with Natalie Roars. Natalie is an award-winning journalist, author, and voiceover artist. With a long list of credits to her name, she adds the badass femme fatale herself, Hannah. We interviewed Natalie a few months ago, but chose to wait until it was closer to the game's release date to upload all the interviews. In this interview, we talk about the history of Fear Effect, the relationship of Hannah and Rain, how the cast came together, as well as some personal stories from Natalie's career. Please enjoy. I just want to let everybody know, The Row Podcast is now on iTunes and will be coming to Google Play soon. If you enjoyed this interview, please drop a like and subscribe for more upcoming interviews from the cast and the developer Sushi. With that being said, let's start the show. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the podcast. We're happy to have you. This is a exciting opportunity for us. This is a fan favorite game from the you know, late 90s, early 2000s that was taken away prematurely. And the rebirth has been kind of something special that we're looking forward to. And you, being the voice of Hannah now, and Sedna is only promising that uh, you might be the new voice of Hannah for the whole series. We hope so. so I hope so, thank too. Thank you again for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. How did you come across the role for Hannah? How did this wind up on your desk? Uh, to be honest, I, I didn't even know what I was auditioning for. Um, I think like with most, most voice actors, we get asked to do weird stuff on the daily and I don't really question what people come to me with. So, uh, Sushi approached me through a casting site where they heard my voice and they didn't tell me who they were. They didn't tell me what the project was. They just gave me a, a background of a scene. They told me what the woman was like that I'd be playing. And they just told me it was a test for a game and that's it. Huh. What kind of description did they give you for Hannah? <sighs> Just a strong badass woman. Um, they told <laughs> yeah, me she had a, sh- right. yeah, yeah, a shady background. Um, if they wanted me to sound, um, oh, I don't know, like I thought something was up, they would say just sound like something's up, but I wouldn't exactly know the backstory. Um, huh. So, so yeah, they came back a few times like that, a few, I, three or four times, and then I found out what it was when they cast me for the beta. So I'm kind of okay. glad I didn't know. I think I would have been a bit intimidated if I knew from the beginning. Did you know what Fear Effect was once you found out what the part was? Had you had any idea what Fear Effect was before? I was familiar with it, but I hadn't played it before. Okay. In fact, I'm sure I saw people playing it in college because my heyday was the late 90s, early 2000s. And <laughs> right. so I'm sure I saw my friends playing it at their dorm rooms, at their apartments. So, yeah, I was I was familiar with it. And after you got the part, did you go back and do any kind of research towards it or maybe go back and watch some videos to see what the original two games were about? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. This is crazy. When we're talking about casting. um, So I got cast in the beta and I was all excited about that. And then Sushi comes back and they told me that they wanted me to stay on for the whole game, but they were going to replace everyone else in the beta, which... (laughs) I can't, I can't believe that at the time because I'm really new to gaming. So I'm just, my head's already blown. My mind's already blown from right. that. But um, then they ask if I'd be interested in casting the rest of the game. 
and directing the actors <laughs> because they're they're French and they needed someone American so they could clearly communicate what they wanted from the other actors. Um, right. And because I have no impulse control, I was like, yeah, sure. That's great. Sure. <laughs> great <time. laughs> um, so that's when I went into casting for the others. And I think that that took my attention away from myself because that was a lot more wild. Um that's pretty interesting. That's got to be a shock to show up and be like, okay, yeah, I got the job. And oh, by the way, you got a promotion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you kind of just handle everything for the yeah. voice actors? I literally <laughs> had a million other things going on at the time, too, because that's when that kind of stuff always happens, you know? So right. <laughs> it, was, it was overwhelming, but I, I'm, it was the coolest thing. It was the best experience. Well, we're looking forward to it. Um, we have all of our faith in you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So none of the voice actors we heard on the demo um, have returned. Not from the, the beta. So the demo is the same, just not the, the original beta that they now, put when out. When you say the beta, do you mean the snow one that was yes. used for Kickstarters? Yes, that okay. one. Okay. So, yeah, so there's um, two demos out there. Okay. Yeah, that's confusing. I'm sorry. Um, in fact, I didn't realize, this is a, another funny story too. I'm so glad you guys are around. I have no one to tell these stories to and I think they're hilarious. <laughs> uh, but... They, when, when we were going into the casting, they said, Hey, when you're casting, we want you to cast actors that sound like the original fear effect. Don't have them sound like the actors from retro helix. I had been huh. listening to the cutscenes for days. I didn't realize they were different actors until they said that. Right. Yeah. I didn't either. It's I new to me. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they have ever used any of the same actors on any three games that have been completed ever. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're all different. So, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Trivia, they did use Wendy Lee for two Fear Effect games. Is she the one that didn't get finished? Yep, in yeah, final. That's it. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that was, uh, huh. that blew my mind. And also, I this is probably the biggest compliment I got uh, as far as casting goes. I read on one of the message boards from someone playing Sedna. They said, oh, I'm so happy they brought back a few of the voice actors. And I thought, yes, <laughs> fold them again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought the same thing, too. When I played the, the demo, I was like, man, the voice acting sounds pretty good. It sounds just like the originals. And then, you know, talking with AJ, he's like, oh, here's, you know, Natalie. She's the voice of Hannah. I was like, oh, that's not the original. <laughs> but it's right, on, it's right on point with it. So. Well, thank you very much. That was the goal. And then, you know, they, they did want it to sound a little bit different, which I think they do a tiny bit. Um, but, you know, the fans love these characters so much. They've been around for so long. So we all did. We wanted to sound like those original characters, but we wanted to be just a tad bit older and a tad bit darker um, right? as time's gone by. Yeah. Kind of leads into one of my next questions here. Um, this is a successor in the series. This is technically the, the third game um, since Inferno was never released. Um, what, like how long after uh, the original fear? Cause you've got retro helix is the mm-hmm. prequel and then you've got fear effect, which is the original. Yeah. How far after, the original game does said to take place. Do you know? Yeah. Hannah, Hannah was born in 2028 and she was, okay. um, she was mid twenties in the original fear effect. So okay. like you said, this is the sequel to that. This takes place uh, four years later. So she'd be um, near, nearing 30, late twenties. So okay. let's Interesting. see math here. Um, this would be the late fifties, 2050s in this game. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. So she's definitely, um, it's, still in line it's just a few years after the game but it's not like 15 years later it's only a few years so everything from original games is still fresh yes yeah but she went through a bunch in that first game (laughs) yeah she really did (laughs) i mean they went to hell that's kind of a lot (laughs) they're they're slightly broken but back okay yeah right uh the original game is revolved around the supernatural and the occult will those elements be present in sedna yes it's it's inuit mythology this time um, oh, okay. I know you couldn't see a lot of the story from the demo, but it gets really crazy, just like people love and they're used to. So it gets really right. over the top crazy as the story goes on, and and you have your puzzles and everything else too. So, yeah, the demo demo was very tame compared to what we were used to, but it still captured a lot of the original elements. Like the soundtrack was great. Um, obviously, the voice acting is phenomenal, and the puzzles. Everything was, you know, the death scenes, it all fit the fear effect. The only thing different was the style of gameplay. Yes. But we didn't see the supernatural part come into it. We saw a lot of, uh, here's a mission, complete this mission, fighting bad guys, solve puzzles. Okay, here's another mission, you know, take this artifact. So um, it's nice to know that they're still keeping with the, the horror, the supernatural, the occult 
elements to it. Oh, yeah. It really opens up just right after where that demo stopped is where it really begins. Oh, excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So then uh, in Fear Effect, in Fear Effect uh, Retro Helix, Hannah was a strong, intelligent, and lethal woman who was not afraid to use her sexuality to get what she wanted. She is also one of the few gay characters in gaming history, which was controversial at the time when it was released. And this first game came out 18 years ago, back in 1999. Mm. And the world has obviously changed. The views have changed since then. So how has Hannah changed with, you know, how we are in society today? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, Because it's cringeworthy thinking back at how it was treated 18 years ago. Yeah, definitely. Like like you said, society has changed a lot in that time. Um, (laughs) Fear fear Effect has changed with it. Sushi doesn't want Rain and Hannah's relationship marketed like in a tabloid way. They're right. they're just a couple. They're a hot couple. Yeah. <laughs> but it's because they're both really good looking people and not so much that they're two women. You know, they're also very strong, too. So that brings a certain appeal to it as well is that, you know, uh, it's a lesbian uh, couple. Yeah. And back in the late 90s, or early 2000s, when Retro Helix came out. Like I said, it was pushed very tabloidish. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of um, skimpy pictures released of them that didn't capture the real relationship that they had. What they are is a strong couple that kicks ass together and they just happen to have a relationship inside of that. Yeah. And they just happen to be they happen to be really sexy people too. So you like right, looking right. at that them. helps too. Yeah, you gotta right. realize too, this goes back to the early, you know, the late nineties marketing. It was from the same company who was publishing Tomb Raider and they relied on the same tactics with the ad marketing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A voluptuous female with guns. <laughs> I mean, they had some risky scenes with uh Retro Helix, but it was never pushed in your face too much it was just the ad marketing right yeah right exactly and uh what are your thoughts on who hannah is i i love her i do how can you not she's badass um (laughs) like we said she's she's been to hell and back literally um literally (laughs) uh, she has a sick sense of humor she doesn't hesitate to get the job done even though she's been through everything uh and she she makes time for love which i don't think we see a lot um but there, there's shading to that, too. Love everything. When you really look at it, and I think it gets more into this in Sedna, everything is done on her terms. So she can be a bit selfish. And I really like that little bit of shading to her. It's, that it's right. brought out a lot in Sedna, too. Oh, looking forward to that. Just mm-hmm. character development. Is yeah. Nice. It, it, we, it's been so long since we've seen them that we're excited to get them back. Yes. And see how, uh, like, you know, we're talking about how society has changed and having sushi take the reins on this and how they're going to take control and develop these characters more it's it's really nice because we we got left off with pretty much nothing so yeah yeah i was actually one of the people back in the day who pre-ordered inferno and they kept (laughs) pushing that release date back and back and back until they finally canceled it in 2004 so when you know sedna was announced i had like people blowing up my facebook they're like did you see it's coming back it's coming back i'm like they're like did you see it's isometric camera though i'm like i don't care it's coming back that's bothering a lot i think that's the biggest challenge actually that it's facing is that but i think if people can just overlook that um and just embrace it that they'll have a lot of fun with it yeah well that's what i said to people too i'm like you have sedna which is the isometric camera you know if it doesn't do too well on release at least we have the remake coming yeah right agreed and you okay i'm gonna i'm gonna nerd out on you for a second here um (laughs) why why i like hannah so much because she reminds me of my favorite badass of my generation which was buffy summers aka buffy Buffy. Buffy. Nice, nice. she reminds me a bit of her and i just i think that's why i i loved her so i had a cat named xander because of that show um (laughs) all my friends had pets named after that show um (laughs) that are no longer around unfortunately but uh but yeah i think she she reminds me a lot of her and it just the nostalgic factor is big for me um that time uh, the kind of characters it's I think it's why it's big for everyone right now it's is the nostalgia right there was kind of a revolution in the uh, mid to late 90s of story you know developing games it went from games that were very simple and linear to now you have these multi-dimensional characters that it's not just about the game it's about the you know the characters themselves their personalities and their trials and everything which makes it so interesting yes yeah and people really attach to characters like you know we're Start off primarily as a Resident Evil uh, channel, and that's still pretty much what we cover, but it doesn't change the fact that during that time period, we were all growing up with these incredible stories being told through gameplay, and, you know, we're 
trying to reach out and, and bring these things back to people and, and connect them with, you know, like yourself with, with the talent behind it. So it's, we're just excited for it. <laughs> well, that's what we want. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Hannah's partner in crime and love is rain. We saw the relationship grow in the prequel reach retro helix, but she was absent from the original game. Rain is uh, back in action for Sedna. How do you feel about how the franchise has handled Hannah and Rain's relationship? I, I love that she's back. I, I mean, people responded to her. And so if you're going to bring the game back, you have to include her. Right. Um, right. So they're living together during Sedna and they're, they're deep in this relationship. So, um, you get to see the dynamics of their relationship more. Like you said, just more character development. They both have flaws and you get to see those in a relationship. And I like that. Um, and like the cast jokes quite a bit about Rain's jealous streak in, in this game. Um, but hey, I mean, I think a lot of people would be if they were dating Hannah. So um, right, right. very protective. I did yeah. notice that in the demo. There's a scene where uh, Rain, Hannah and Deke are together. And Deke looks over at Hannah. She's like, don't even look at her. Yes. And it happens a lot. She's a, she's a jealous thing in, in Sedna. So, um, yeah, we like it, though. And we get to see that they're they're strong and they're badass. But just like everyone else, they have flaws. And, and it's yeah, very exactly. cool. Yeah. And there's, there's uh, you know, in the demo, there's a, a moment where the, the elevator scene with Rain mm-hmm. and Hannah, they're riding the elevator together. And, and they're talking about, you know, Hannah and know her personality what she likes and what she dislikes and, and even rain has this, uh, there's a fragileness to her there basically like is hannah gonna move on is she gonna leave me behind um what's this relationship but then hannah's reassuring you know this is there's things that i love that i hold on to forever and i i really really like how that's gonna grow and then we get to see these characters continue on their storyline together oh and it does grow it does it's really fun to watch it's a different yeah, it's definitely a different dynamic than when you first saw them together and fall in love. It's it's different. They've been together for a while. They're guards down. Right. Yeah. They've experienced some things. How is um the, the events of Fear Effect and in Hannah basically you know going to hell and and the whole uh, storyline through that that Rain wasn't part of? How does that stuff come back into the game later? I mean, did this do they bring up those events a lot? Do they talk about it? Is there any uh, resentment with Rain being left behind during Ooh. all that? Or You know, you saying that, there should have been a little resentment, shouldn't there? Um, just right. like an inside joke kind of thing. There should have been. Um, yeah. There's not resentment there. I, I don't want to ruin anything, but the stories do cross over. So it's mentioned, um, and there are, there are events that tie into this from, from okay, hell. Okay, so they definitely, they're not forgetting the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. It's good to know. <laughs> so, Ed, uh, Fear Effect was released in 1999, and even after getting the third title canceled, it still has a loyal fan base. What is it about Fear Effect, in your opinion, that captured those fans and has kept them loyal all these years? Oh, the characters, the puzzles, the mythology, the sex, the danger, the blood. I mean, there's there's not a lot not to like. Um, right. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think it's any of these things by themselves or all of these things together. I think it just has this cool, intangible quality. Um, that no formula can produce, you know, otherwise everyone would do it if, if they knew the secret to it. Um, right. Yeah. And it, like you said, it's just it captured something about that time. And it's what we want it. We want it to come back and just experience it again for a bit. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's just it has magic. It's kind of like the, uh, the total package of badass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the nostalgia behind yeah. it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. OK. Uh, at Gamescom 2017, it was announced that Fear Effect was getting a remake. Just as you're finishing up Senna, have you have you been approached to voice Senna or Hannah for the remake? And that comes from Eddie Krueger. I love that name, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it's seriously. So close to Freddy. I think it's intentional. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if not, you have an awesome yeah. name. <laughs> uh, l- OK, so let me just put this out here first. I would love to. Um, but I think all of the actors that ever played in this series would love to, too. Um, honestly, that, that hasn't been decided yet. And I'm not just saying that, like I know something and I'm hiding it. I, I really don't know. I'd probably be screaming it from the rooftops if I did. So that's probably why I don't. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. Hopefully I, I find out something soon, but it would be, it would be very cool. And I would, I would love that opportunity. Well, I think I can speak for both Jeff and I when we say we both want you back. So. Oh, thank yes, you. And I think they're pushing for a 2018 release is what I had heard. So if they're planning to, you know, do a full remake with the voice acting, they would probably be starting that soon, I would hope. So hopefully we'll hear something really quickly 
And, you know, like AJ said, you definitely have our vote for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the voice acting really comes at the end. It comes very late. Yeah, it takes a long time, especially with something like this where it's stylized and, and animated. And, you know, it used to be cell shaded, but the animation has changed since then. I'm sure it's gotten a little bit easier and also more difficult at the same time. Yeah. That there's a lot of work between that the development team has to do before they can bring you guys in to record your parts. Yeah, yeah, we really come in. It it surprises me still how how late we come in in the game a lot. Interesting. This is uh, kind of a spinoff question on that. Just a, a what if situation, you know, hopes and dreams. I wonder if we could ever see an animated movie, you know, evolving around um, Fear Effect or even a live action, but animated I would prefer because. Let me just that. say again, I would love to do that. I have been saying for years, I wish they would uh, release Inferno as a movie or, an, you know, yeah. some kind of series, something to yeah. finish it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a series would be a great. Would uh, be great. Uh, I mean, look at what they did with Castlevania. Just Netflix, um, call us. <laughs> yeah, Netflix. Hey, let's, let's work this out. I mean, Natalie's a writer. So <laughs> Done. You already got Done. people there. <laughs> you got loyal fans that can help you guide the way. <laughs> that, would, that would be that awesome. Would be awesome. That would be really, yes. really interesting. So, um, being put in charge of the casting for Sedna, um, was there any complications? What was that like uh, having to recast the voice actor? So, you know what? I learned a lot as a voice actor being on the casting side of something this big. Um, right. I think listening to auditions was was one of the biggest learning experiences for me ever um, because you do hear how many people deliver things exactly the same. Um, and just the little, you don't want to stand out too much, but just a little bit. Um Right. So that, that was just fascinating from a work standpoint for me. But uh, how, it, how I went about it is I went to just traditional casting boards and I, I put out the casting information and I also went to casting sites and I would listen to people. I, I went for the tone first. So I would watch the cutscenes from Fear Effect and I would just listen to the tone and I would close my eyes and I would push on people's demos. And if their tone matched, I would flag them. And then I took the people with the tone. I would ask them for auditions. And I, I probably I listened to hundreds of auditions for, for the lead people. Um, and so if I liked their tone, I would put them in a matching tone box. And then I would go by acting next. So the best actor with the right tone. Um, and I, would, I picked my five favorites for each category. And I sent those to Sushi. And then Sushi made the final call out of my top five. See, that's interesting. We've interviewed you know, a lot of talented voice actors. But we've never heard about the casting slide like this. It was uh, it, it was really cool. It was really fun. Um, and it's nice to give people good news because you know what that's like. You know, I think um, right. voice actors are professional auditioners. I, I still audition every single day. Um, so it's really nice to be on the other end to contact someone and say that they got this really cool role because right. who wouldn't who wouldn't want to be in this? So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was fun. It was a learning experience. And um, yeah, I would do that again. I really enjoy casting. Like when you would uh, audition for the part of Hannah, you didn't know what you were auditioning for. And so later yeah. you just got a description of the character. Um, your fellow cast, uh, how were their reactions receiving the news and finding out what this is actually going to be? For? Oh, well, uh, a couple were big fans. Uh, the person that plays oh, Deke awesome. was a big fan. So he was super excited. Um, <laughs> yeah, Deke's an awesome character. Yeah, so. yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of us, I think, are around the, the same age, too. So a lot of us, it was. That was... Um, you know, our, our, our glory years, so to speak. So, um, right, I'll, yeah, right. I'll, I'd say most of the cast was familiar with it um, and was just very excited. And and those that weren't that looked it up, once they looked it up, they were very excited. So And then it progressed to now we're getting, you know, the remake and there's potential there. So it's it's a really good situation. Yes, it is. And, it, you know, of course, they want to know, as, as I would like to, too, what's going on with the remake? Are you guys going to need anybody? Right, um, right. You know, and so again, I don't know anything. And if I did, I would, I would, yeah, it's why, it's why I don't, because I would say something. <laughs> right. We'll keep an eye out for it. Hopefully we find something else. <laughs> okay. Um, being an award winning author, were you asked to help in the writing process at all? I, I, I don't think they knew that I was an author when they hired me. Um, and I, I honestly was finishing up my latest book at the time. So I, I wouldn't have had time to help, even if they asked, which they, they didn't ask. Um, but that, it would, again, I, I have no impulse control. It wouldn't be something I'd be against. If <laughs> someone came to me one day and said, hey, you want to do this? I'd probably say sure. So, um, and would love it. So on the topic of your writing, you've written three books. You've written two fictional books, which is Lucid and Beneath Them, and one instructional book, How to Become a Voiceover Artist, which I recommend to everybody. If you're interested in the field 
the career uh, this is highly recommended this is one of those books that everybody says to go get and uh, all of them have had incredible reviews uh, what are your your inspirations when you create uh, your novels like lucid and beneath them because they're very unique books with very interesting characters that uh, have challenges they're facing and overcoming it's not your typical I mean they both like uh, in lucid your main character was uh, was born dis- disfigured he's been like in the ostracized his whole life he's been an outcast and he tries to find his acceptance and, and move on and become confident and get love in his life through this, you know, weird lucid dreaming therapy. <laughs> and then beneath them, your character is, uh, I, I believe he's on the run. Yes. I haven't had a chance to get into it. And he's hiding underneath this house in their crawl space. And he's connecting with this family that doesn't know he's there, who has their own issues. It's a weird, weird, like you said, stalker yes. type relationship because he's living underneath their house. So. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think I'm a tortured 14 year old boy on the inside i do um i don't know i don't know why i write like that um i I, quite literally i am the adhd kid that grew up and learned how to harness their powers for good instead of evil (laughs) so i have a whole file of book and film ideas and it has like hundreds of ideas in there i just write them down every time they hit me um lucid i i was just driving in the car like back from the grocery store or something one day and uh i came up with that and i I called a friend of mine who works in the film industry and i told him he should do this and he was like hey you're a journalist you write all the time why don't you write it um (laughs) and i I was like oh i am aren't i i do do that okay uh I'll write it. And I did. So that's that's literally how that happened. Um, beneath them was a, a little bit more painful of an idea. I, I worked in, in news at the time still, and I was um, becoming disturbed by how we desensitize ourselves, myself included, to societal injustices so that we can go about our lives. And uh, though it right. is necessary, you just it doesn't sit well with you. And um, I just had something painful to get off my chest with that one. So that one was a... Uh, an emotional piece for me. Well, that one was just released in July. And from what I understand about the, your writing process, you started writing it and about halfway. You started working with, um, I forget the lady's name. Maybe you can. Yes. Um, what was her name? You worked with her, but you turned it the second half of the book into a screenplay. And then I had to go back and actually finish it as a book. Is that right? Yes. This is it's such a cool. I, I love how this happened. So her name's Molly Elfman and she's a filmmaker. And I was, I was halfway through this book. And I kind of put it aside. I was going to pick it back up at some point. I just didn't know when. And um, I met her on a film set. And she said, hey, what are you working on? What are you doing next? And I said, oh, well, I have this story. And I told her about it. And I said, you know, it might make a good screenplay. I don't know. And she said, well, let's do it. And I said, okay, because I have a problem not saying okay. So (laughs) we did. We sat down and we wrote it. The second half. So the first half became the first half of the book became the first half of the screenplay. And then the two of us sat down and finished the screenplay together. And then I went back and finished the book. Um, So it's like the the book inspired the screenplay, but the screenplay inspired the book. It's really, really interconnected. And I I feel like the screenplay is a little bit more her and the book's a little bit more me. Um, So it's uh, we're very similar, though. Her and I, I, I don't know if I'll ever meet someone else that I have such a similar writing style with. So she was fun to work with. It was really fun working with her. Um, But yeah, that's how that that's how that all came about. So since it's in screenplay format, is it being worked on to put into a film? Yes. So Molly has a ton of other projects she needs to finish first (laughs) before she can get to this. But she would like to direct this. She wants this to be like her feature directorial debut. Um, And she has some fantastic ideas that that aren't at all in the book. Um, just ways okay. of presenting this. And uh, they're really original and really cool. So I would say it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll keep an eye out for it. Hopefully it comes out soon. It sounds interesting. I like the concept behind it. And like I said, you get these um, these kind of tortured souls uh, through your characters. No. They're, you know, they face challenges. They're uh, not your normal people. I think- <laughs> and they're, they're kids, you know, kids struggling with yeah. stuff. Yeah wind up in these situations yeah i think i'm a a really happy person and everyone needs an outlet so i think maybe in art i get to express more pain so yeah right once you get some of those emotions out some of the darker parts that you got to express in your instructional book uh how to become a voiceover artist like i said highly recommended um all the reviews that i've seen have come back with nothing but praise 
and it seems to be a great thing to help people who are interested in joining the career field. Is there any advice you can give to the people who are interested uh, in becoming a voiceover artist? And obviously, I'm going to recommend everybody go that's interested to go buy the book. But is there any kind of points or tips you'd like to throw out? Uh, I think patience. Patience is probably patience, my best right. advice. That goes for anything, though, really, right? Um, patience, right, right. learning. I think learn about the business. I, I, a lot of people, you know, want to think because it, it is fun that it's it's all fun and games, but it's a business. Um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of paperwork involved in the day. Um, you know, it, it's the majority of your day isn't spent performing. So I think um, as long as people learn, they realize that it's a business and um, and and I don't believe in no. I believe in finding another way to make something work. So okay. if you're hearing no, that's just part of your day and it doesn't matter, you're going to find a different way to do it or someone else to do it with. Um, huh. So that's that's probably, those are my my little nuggets. I've actually got a, a copy in the mail coming oh, soon. So. That's awesome. That, I love hearing I, that. I started, I started reading some of the, um, the pieces that Amazon had shown and I was like, wow, this is awesome. Oh, so. thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I think um, too, a lot of people, it's so slow. This, I, I'm not going to lie. It took me seven years of working at this before I could leave my job and do this full time. That's a long time. And right. I mean, working at it every single day. Um, and a lot of times I think the people that make it, aren't the people with the most talent. I think the people that make it are the ones that just, they stay there while everyone else leaves. Right. The most persistent. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day. Actually, that actually goes with what we used to do back in the day. Uh, like when you were saying about the advice, you had to get used to hearing no, but at the same time, back in the day, we used to be on a forum that uh, did amateur voice acting. Oh, and, you know, they would have the audition process, but instead of just saying no for an audition when you would get it, they would actually send back, you know, what you can improve on, you know, if you want to try again. That's so important. That's so nice. That's so nice to get feedback like that. Yeah, it's the best thing. Right, I mean, right. even if it, it hurts, it's the best thing that you can hear. Right. Constructive criticism. I don't know how legal it was, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> um, legal yeah, shit. used to be... It was a good way to get your voice out there. And one of the people who used to be on there was Christina B. And now she's doing professional dubbing work with Viz Media. Ah, yeah. I mean, it is. You just you see the same people around time and time again on social media, too. Um, the same people that are just at it every day, you know, whether they're working, they're practicing or going to a class or doing something right. there that you see the same people all the time. We've kind of seen that, too, mm -hmm. with some of our other guests we've talked to. It's, you know, um, Interviewing one person has led into interviewing another person because they simply said their name and it got me curious. And I look up another ah. person and then I find out this other person is tied to somebody else. They're all interconnected yeah. with, you know, projects they've worked on. And it's not just one series. It's like, okay, they did this one game or they did this one movie, but then they went and got cast for another one, which happened to have this same person from a different one. It's it's really incredible. It's It seems to be such a large field, but also a very small field. Yeah, and it's a nice field. Oh, my gosh. They're just the nicest people in voiceover, everyone's so helpful too. You you think it's everyone's competitive because it's acting, but it's not. We're all so when your face isn't involved, it really is just the tone of your voice. And if it's right for a part, it's right for a part. You can't make yourself if you don't just naturally sound like that. I think um, so. Right. There's there's a lot less of the competition and just oh, let me help you. Let me introduce you to someone, and you don't feel that it's taking work away from you. It's a job you weren't going to get anyway. So you're helping right, them, right. you know, it's just, it's just really, it's, it's warm and it's friendly and it's filled with just the best people I've ever met. Yeah. I've heard about that too, that if you weren't cast for it, that sometimes you, you know, people will recommend someone else that they know that actually fits the part good and they'll end up getting it. And there's no animosity there. It's None. okay. I wasn't right for it, but you know, I helped somebody else get it and you know, kudos to them. Yeah, And maybe that's too, because like I, I said, you do get a lot of rejection in your professional auditioner. You, you do in, in on-screen acting. Um, I'm familiar with that, but the, the amount of auditions you go through every day as a voice actor, I mean, you could audition for six projects in one day daily. Um, so oh, you're wow. just, you're used to hearing no all the time and it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to hear no. Um, if you're doing it for, you stay yeah, unless I mean, it's something that you dreamed of your whole life and you got an audition for them. That would, that <laughs> right. would obviously Then hurt. that might stick a little bit. Yeah. You were saying earlier, like when you auditioned for uh, Fear Effect, you didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And half these auditions coming out now, you don't know what you're auditioning for. 
No, that's true. And you don't you don't question because it is it's a high volume thing to do this for a living. You're just constantly turning jobs and you, right. you don't ask, you don't follow up. Um, not often. So, yeah, it wasn't surprising at all to be to be asked to do something strange and and not know right. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of on screen, I just saw the trailer for uh, Gerald's game today, and I know you have a part in that. <gasps> that trailer was oh, so man. good. That trailer was yes, so good. Yes, it looks incredible. Oh, it looks intense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super, super excited. Um, yeah, Gerald's game premieres on Netflix, and you'll see me at the end of that film. Okay. And that film, first, okay, it's a dream come true on so many levels, and here's why: Stephen King was my first love. Um, I think I was eight years old when I fell in love with him. I've read everything he's ever written. Gerald's Game is quite literally one of my favorites. And the director and writer of Gerald's Game, I mean, not the book writer, that's Stephen King, of course, but the, the adaptation, right. uh, is my college roommate and one of my dearest, oldest friends, Mike. Oh, wow. Um, so oh, I wow. got to be in a film of per- someone that I just absolutely adore with someone that I absolutely adore um, and it just, yeah, I mean, it was a culmination of a lot of things. It's a very small moment in the film, but for me, it's a very big moment in my life. Um, right, right. so it was, it was, it was very cool and I cannot wait to see it. Like it's one of those movies where you enjoy watching it, but it's also painful to watch at the same yes. time. <laughs> yes. I was one, and you know, it just, and Mike talks about this in, in plenty of interviews, but you, and when you, people heard it was going to be a movie and when he told me he was going to do this movie, the first thing I thought was, and first thing he thought was, how are you going to do that? Um, right, if you're right. familiar with the book, it's it's a difficult one. Um, right. but they found ways around it and how to make it just incredible. And yeah, oh gosh, audiences are going to love it. They're going to love it. Yeah. Um, I just recently watched uh, Mike's other film, and it, Kate Siegel is his wife. Is yes. that right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I watched Hush because um, I've been meaning to for so long, and I finally watched it. And it, wow, it was it was <laughs> so good. I should have watched it a long time ago, but it was definitely worth the wait. Kate was amazing in it. Mike, awesome directing. So I, I'm only excited for this one. Oh, my gosh. More. I can't wait to tell him to listen to this so he can hear it. <laughs> I love that we're talking about <laughs> A little bit of praise um, and shout outs. But, uh, yeah, it, Hush, Hush is on Netflix right now for anybody yes. who wants to go watch it. It's a thriller um, concept behind it, which you know actually kind of revolves around what we're talking about. Um, his wife, Kate, plays the main character. And she is deaf. She is a writer. And there is a serial killer that is basically playing games with her in her house in the middle of nowhere. So. It's horrifying. It's so scary. Oh, it's yeah. It's another. It's another intense movie. Yeah. I, and the way they filmed it with um with her, you know, with her being deaf and just oh, it was it was so well done. It really was. It was. That was um that may be my favorite. He's done a lot of stuff, and that that one might be my favorite. But I remember watching it um in the middle of the day, and my palms were sweating, and I love scary yeah, stuff. Yeah, same thing. Mm-hmm. I couldn't turn it off. You know, I, was, I had everything trying to go on around me in the world, you know, uh, family and, and things, dinner, all these things that were happening. I was like, I, I got to watch this. Yeah. <laughs> everything has to wait. I have to see what happens. Yeah, hush. Check it out for sure. Check it out. Yeah, hush. Definitely. It's on Netflix. And then look for um, for uh, Girls Game later this month because that also looks incredible. And it's, you know, another Stephen King uh, concept novel. It comes out this week, which is another great yeah. one. So you guys have me filling this notebook up with recommendations now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, next question here. You've had a long, successful career at both radio and news. Um, you've done, you know, um, radio jockey for a mm-hmm. while, and then you had a, a couple news anchor jobs. Um, and you left it behind to pursue a career in voice acting, which you said you worked to get to a point where you could leave those behind. Yeah. What made you make that transition? Oh, this is getting deep. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I liked, I I enjoyed news. I really did. I mean, I did it for over a decade, so you have to like it. Um, it wasn't my passion in life. Um, and if you're going to work those just awful hours and you're going to miss holidays with your family, you, you better really love what you're right. doing. Um, and so the, the hours actually started taking a toll on my health. Um, I didn't sleep more than five hours a night for, for years. And um, I, I thought, OK, you know, my health is important. I really need to do something. I'm getting older. And I thought, well, I guess I'll give up writing and voice acting. I'll give up all my other stuff on the side. Um, and I, I had a pretty nice business built up on the side. I wasn't sure I could pay the bills just yet, but it was it was a nice size. Um, and the thought of that was crushing. 
And then I thought, okay, well, what if I quit news? Right. My regular paycheck. And I go all in. Like, what if I what if I give my business 100 percent of my focus and I, I quit? That had, that had um, to be scary. How see, would I feel? Already, you know, it was you're terrifying. Guaranteed every day. This is what I know I can do. I'm good at it. I can get paid for it. But it's not what I want to do. Yes. To leave that to take a chance is that's got to be a, a very scary feeling. It's it's the scariest thing I've I've ever done. And thankfully, it worked out. But um, but yeah, I think. um <sighs> I don't even know going and thinking about it just makes my stomach. I get butterflies in my stomach thinking right. about making that choice again. It was a really big one. And it sounds like it was really simple just recapping it like this. But it was. And I agonized over it for months right. um, before making that decision. And um, and you took a long and it was time, a good one. long time building up um, the career with voice acting and writing to where you could actually make that transition comfortably, even though it was scary because it's the unknown. But you had taken the yeah. time like. There's a lot of people that um, take example, like for for live streamers that do broadcasting for games, that do Twitch and YouTube, or they want to become, you know, this internet sensation that they just quit their job on a dime, say, stop, I'm going to go do this, dedicate everything. But then they end up failing because they weren't ready to make that transition yet. Yes. Yeah. And I, it was, it was in my, I, and first of all, I'm just, you can laugh at the fact I'm probably the only person in the world to leave a steady television sh- job for voiceover. <laughs> Um, but it, it was, it, it's what I wanted to do. I had been doing it for years and I had enough that I was like, you know, I can pay the majority of the bills. And if I give it all my focus, I can probably make up the rest. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't think I, I yeah, I'm too practical. I, I would not have made that jump if I didn't have it built up enough. It still wasn't comfortable enough for me. I, it was my, like my, my five year plan and it became, you know, something that happened much earlier than I expected. But um, but yeah, I, I would not have left if I didn't think. I wouldn't have left if I thought my mortgage was on the line or we, right. we were going to get kicked out of our right, house. Exactly. I, I wouldn't have. Yeah, and I don't recommend that to anyone. Yeah, <laughs> certainly don't want anyone to go out and run and quit their job because it's not their passion. I, you know, that's... <laughs> right. Practice. I mean, it did pay off. I mean, you're now playing one of the most iconic characters that's in video true. games, so... <laughs> Still don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do, do it yet. Ready. But... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> practical and passion. Right. Yeah. Pra- uh, like passion and practical and patience yeah. and persistence, right? <laughs> the four yes, P's of becoming P's. Uh, yes. successful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so from back in the days of, of both, you know, being on the radio and in the news, do you have any memorable moments, anybody particularly you met or a story that you covered or some uh, great segment that really stands out? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I got to do a lot of fun things. Over 10 years, I got to do a lot of fun things. Um, and I don't take that for granted. Like uh, interviewing Dolly Parton yeah, was I, I a dream. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love her. I love her. It's scary how much I love her. Uh, they probably wouldn't let me interview her if they knew how much I loved her. Um, I got to swing on a trapeze. Um Oh, there was a whole year that I got to work at the zoo, so I had lemurs on my head, and I got to feed crocodiles. Um, and then, of course, you know, I covered more serious life moments. But um, it was just really different every day, and it was neat to to look at life through that lens. Um, I feel like I'm living life more, whereas before I was reporting on life, just my whole life was reporting on on other people and other things. Right, right. Um, and I feel like I'm actually experiencing it now. So it was neat to be on both sides. Um and, and I will say this, if you know anyone that's leaving news, hire them. Um, it taught me wonderful skills like shooting, editing. Uh, you can write like the wind thanks to ridiculous deadlines. You will have huh. a dedicated, broken worker that will <laughs> do anything for you and do it just at the speed of light. Um, newsies are great. They're great people. It's an interesting field. You, you cover a lot. You see a lot, like you said, but you're not always living your life and making your own memories you're living other people's memories and uh so now you know you're taking that step and now you're making your own so yeah like it was really neat um i live in the south and so when it flurries like I, i'm flurries they shut down school yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so it, you know we had some actually kind of significant storms here and we we don't have like you know the the means to take care of it, like all the snow plows and the sand and everything for a significant snowfall. Right. So it happened once or twice when I was in news and instead of playing with my kid, you know, like everyone else was and being home, I was sleeping at the station and and reporting on it. And that's great. It's a wonderful community service and I'm glad that I did it. But it, it is really nice now when something happens that I can experience it with my family too, that I, that I got to do both. 
And sometimes it's not um, – you don't receive a whole lot of gratitude for what you do. People expect it from you. And and I – just recently, I'm, you know, I'm in the South as well. I'm actually in Texas. And with Harvey coming through, uh, we're glued yeah. to the TV. To, you know, we're a little bit north of where it hit. So we got yes. the outer edge of it. But we're glued to the TV to see to make sure our family and friends are okay that are more south. And when they would go offline from a live broadcast, through Facebook or whatever format they were on, people would blow up on it. Be like, you need to keep reporting. And it's like, no, they have – their own families to worry about you know they, they're doing us a service by staying active and reporting it but at the same time they've got their own concerns and i can yeah. just imagine how difficult that could be yeah it's one of those those jobs i think and i do i do i think you're right i think you expect that from paramedics you expect that right, right. from police officers but you don't realize that you know the people on the news they, they don't have nannies they don't have child care oftentimes i I've, I've brought my baby to the station before i had my baby <laughs> right. to the desk a couple times um, you, know, you just you you don't have uh, the kind of support that you need. And it happens quite a bit that you're needed to stay. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah. Yep. Any upcoming projects other than Fear Effect we should be looking for? Uh, you mentioned Gerald's game. So that's September 29th. Um, there's also a really pretty game called Caligo that was greenlit on Steam. Um I was looking at that. I had I couldn't figure out what it was about. I couldn't find a whole lot of information. I found Caligo on Steam, but I wasn't sure if that was the right one. So yeah, and I just saw. I, I literally just saw like an hour ago on YouTube that they released a trailer. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so I'm. I, I and I I haven't gotten a chance to look at it, so I don't know what it says about dates on there. But I assume if they're releasing a trailer, it's going to be any day now. Um, you've done a few games. Um, you've, well, you, there was a mobile one that was the the bakery one. Is that right? Yes, uh, recipes passion. Yes, which is um, sort of like um, the Candy Crush and candy things crush. like that, where you match up the uh, designs. But it was revolves around a bakery. <laughs> yes, yeah, that was really cute. I like that. Um, I'm a Candy Crush fan. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's addictive. <laughs> it is addictive. Um, yeah, and then I, I've done some VR games, but those are already out, like uh, Landfall right, right. and Terminal for Terminal, um, right? Oculus. Um, but yeah, I can't think of any anything besides Caligo and Gerald's game for this month. Okay. Those are the ones that I can think of for this month. And Caligo is spelled C A L I G O for anybody who's interested to go take a look at it. Go check out the trailer. I know I'm going to do that when I get done here. So I yes. I'm, I really want to see what's about. So uh, just to add on to that, do you have any dream roles you would like to play? Oh, I have a new dream every day. So <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm really enthused about life in general and pretty much anything that comes along, I just fall in love with. Um, so no, nothing, nothing in particular. I'd love to be uh, involved with the rest of Fear Effect. That would be great. Yes, that would definitely. be a dream. <laughs> um, yes, please. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, really anything. I, I like being surprised. I like when things just come along and going with the flow and... Um, and uh, I like I like to be shocked myself. I like to be surprised. So, well, uh, obviously, Fear Effect is a big one. We hope to see you in that and then more down the road uh, as, as you get more into the actual gaming part of stuff. You've got a few titles you've done, but Fear Effect is definitely a big one to get into. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's so cool. I'd love to do conventions with it, too. So um, we'll see what happens when it comes out. I've heard in order to get into conventions, um, either the convention itself will contact you, but mostly it's the push for the fans to make the convention reach out to the talent. So if, if you guys want to meet Natalie in person, you know, the voice of Hannah and Sedna and hopefully the future here, make sure you're reaching out to your local conventions and see if maybe you can organize the Fear Effect panel. Oh my gosh, you guys are so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I love to have you here. We have two big ones here, as well as several other ones. We have a couple of small ones that are anime based or you know which is strongly more voice acting than, than some of the other ones but we do a, uh, a horror one and then we have a normal one twice twice a year so there's a lot going on in this town so. yeah i think the, the southeast region in a whole is really growing isn't it right yes uh, definitely. it's yeah technology technology's leveled the playing field right um we were saying this, I think, before we started the interview, but things 10 years ago that exist now weren't even dreamt of 10 years ago. I wouldn't have yeah. this job 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, people were still mailing their tapes, you know? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really, really cool. So I think that the, how technology is just changing things that we're going to see all these new huge markets just growing and expanding in all different areas. So speaking of technology, um, social yes. media, do you have any um, shout outs for your social media that you want people to follow you on where they can keep up the date 
Yes, please. Um, Natalie Rohr. My last name's like Rogers, take out the G, R-O-E-R-S. But I'm under Natalie Rohrs on Twitter, Facebook. Um, Instagram's my new favorite. I'm really getting an Instagram. A lot of people um, like Instagram. Yeah, you know why? I was I was talking to um to a friend about this the other day. On not that I don't like the other social media channels, I use them all. But um, I feel like you can you can see some really negative stuff on the other channels, but you never really do on Instagram. Huh. And I like the reason for this. When we actually stop to capture a moment, it's never negative. That's true. That's and a good I, point. I love that. There's something about that I just really, really dig. Yeah, that's um, a very good point. So it's it's fun. If you just scroll through your feed right now, you're not going to really see anything. Right. It's usually know? positive. Like you said, it's capturing a moment. Nobody ever stops to capture or anything negative unless they yeah. have a point to make. But it's usually yeah. something positive. Or they have a sick sense of humor and it's kind of <laughs> right. funny. But, this is um, true. This is true. <laughs> yeah. So, which is also I enjoy too. So, you know, yeah, the, the Instagram is definitely my favorite, but I, I use them all. So please, please okay. connect and yes. uh, we'll chat. We will put links below uh, so you guys can go ahead and click and follow and uh, keep up to date. Because, like, you know, if anything comes out, any word comes out, we get any information. I'm sure Natalie will post it as soon as she finds out. So, Yeah, I'm very active on social media. I'm on there all the time. Excellent. Uh, do you have any parting words for the fans? Anything about Fear Effect or just your fans in general? Um, I want to thank you guys for, for giving us a platform like this. I think it's... um. We said this at the beginning. It's really fun to share stories, and usually nobody wants to hear about them. Because they oh, don't. we do. I know yeah. I do. <laughs> so it, it's oh, nice do. to have a place to go where um, where you can share this with people that are interested in it. Yes. Um, so so thanks for that. I think it's really cool. It's cool for everybody that that um, I enjoy your channel very much. I binge watched your episodes. So <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's fun. I like you guys. Genuinely get along, and you're fun to listen to, and you have great content. So. Yeah, just thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. We really appreciate that. You're awesome. And we've had a pleasure having you on here. Really, we're, we're very fortunate and lucky just to be in the position that we are to to have these conversations and share these experiences with, with everybody. It's, it's amazing. Aww. As a fan of the franchise, this was a great interview. Natalie is a wonderful person, and it's no question that she will do the character justice. It seems like the effort has been put in all around to bring Fear Effect back in a major way. Be sure to check out Natalie's books, Lucid, Beneath Them, and How to Become a VoiceOver Artist. You can also hear Natalie in the new and very interesting game, Caligo. Follow her on social media to show support, and of course, stay tuned for more interviews with the cast and developers of Fear Effect Sedna. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a like and make sure to subscribe for more. And if you're listening on iTunes, please leave us a review as it helps the show a ton. I want to give a big shout out to all of our patrons for helping support the show and making this possible. Thank you all so much. And this podcast was brought to you by our Master of Unlocking Patreon tier members, which is our highest level, Proxy1, Chris Lambert, and Amy Notama. Thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you back at the Residence of Evil. <laughs>